We've been in a series walking through Romans chapter 8. This past weekend, Pastor Jeff Wallace, can I just say it this way, brought the fire. It was absolutely incredible. That message from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. We took a little bit of a respite from our Romans 8 series because I really wanted us to spend time pre-election, post-election, talking about Romans 8, 28. There are five verses that are most highlighted amongst Bible apps. Verse number one, no surprise, no shocker, John 3, 16. The second most highlighted verse in Bible app world would be Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. The third most highlighted verse would be Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens, strengthens me. And then the fourth most highlighted verse would be Psalm 23, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, finish the verse out, I will fear no evil. Then verse 5, or actually verse that's most highlighted, fifth on the list, would be Romans 8.28. And today we seek to unpack that verse, to explain that verse Because I believe oftentimes people misapply that verse, misinterpret that verse. And so I just really wanted us to slow our roll. I want to use this analogy. I don't want to just microwave a message. I want us to sit in this message. And I want this message in regards to Romans 8.28 to feel like we're simmering and sauteing like my mama used to do with some pork chops with a crock pot. Does that make sense to anybody else in this room besides me? I need the fragrance of Romans 8.28 to permeate this place, not only in our house, but in your house as well. And so Romans 8.28 is our message today. And so I go to the mailbox as I have this entire series in Blue's Clues fashion. Just listening for some giggles. Yeah, just, we're still giggling about this. But we open the letter of what God desires to drop in your mailbox to see the significance of his love and his grace and his mercy towards you. You'll see it in your listener guide, but I just want to double down on it. You are more than your setbacks. Every bit of your mistakes, your failures, every bit of what you've been going through, the struggles, even things that you've not done but they've been done to you, somehow, some way, we got to get to this target statement based upon this statement. There's never a moment in your life that will not be used for your good. There'll never be a moment in your life that will not be used for your good. You go, Ed, what about And then you could fill in the blank. Because all of us in this room have a fill in the blank that we have a tendency to look to God and go, but what about fill in the blank? And every single one of us will face a situation, a level of strife, go through a struggle, or even see the consequences of our own sin and wonder how God can turn it around. And my hope and prayer today is that we would understand the significance of Romans 8, 28. And so if you have a listener guide, and I know you do, and you got something to write with, and by the way, your pastor's dream, to know that you're engaged in this message. This is more than a monologue. This is a dialogue. You go, Ed, what does that mean? That means you're going to talk back to me this morning. That means you're going to help the preacher today. That means you're going to give me some amens, and somehow you're going to clap at some incredible poignant moments. Here's the reason why, because I believe it's more than a preacher talking to you today. I believe that God wants to drop a message in your mailbox that you can walk out and live out in your heart. Come on, can I get an amen from somebody in the house? All right. We're preheating right now. We're warming up. Romans 8, 28, I chose to put this in your notes. I wanted to come from the New International Version. I typically preach from the ESV, the English Standard Version, but I wanted to read from the NIV Here's the reason why, because I love the order of these statements. And it says, and we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We'll look at to those who love him and called according to his purpose next weekend, thus the crockpot analogy. I want us to sit in this for a while. But I want to give you four points, four principles, four precepts. Under this title, you're more than your setbacks, that come from these phrases, these words, I've highlighted them. Well, exegete, that's a big fancy word of just saying we're seeking to extrapolate. That's another big word, but we're just trying to dig out. Come on, y'all with me today? We're, we're diving into the cereal box and we're looking for the prize. That's what we're looking I just dated myself right there, did I not? <laughs> so we're digging in today. We believe there's a prize for us and we're seeking and searching for that. But praise God, the Holy Spirit is already putting on the table for us to discover it. You don't have to hunt for it. God wants you to see it today. I want you to notice point number one, write this down. There's an undeniable, undeniable confirmation. Undeniable confirmation. It says, and we know 
that. I highlighted the word no because I wanted you to know what the word no means. The word no means to become aware, discern, or discover. Albert Einstein was traveling from Princeton on a train. All of a sudden, the train conductor begins to punch tickets. Albert Einstein begins to pat his jacket, looks on both sides of his coat, and has no ticket in hand. The train conductor says, Dr. Einstein, we know who you are. It's okay. The train conductor continues down the aisleway, punching tickets, comes back and discovers Albert Einstein is on his hands and knees looking underneath the seat for his ticket. One more time, the train conductor said, Dr. Einstein, we, we know who you are. It's okay. And then Albert Einstein said these words. He said, young man, he said, I know who I am, but the reason why I'm looking for this ticket is because I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> you may know who you are, but you may not know where you're going. That word know is very strategic and specific. Here's the reason why. Because the Apostle Paul wants you to know that you know, that you can know, that when your life comes to an end, that you can be in heaven, not because our good deeds, not because our good merits, not because our good efforts, but because of Jesus Christ and the finished work upon the cross of Calvary. Come on, can we clap to that today? Which creates... Confidence and courage. I've experienced salvation, but can I just be quite forthtelling today? There's a lot of days where I wrestle with my own salvation. One of the things I will not do is stand on a stage and pretend like I got it all together. You say, Ed, are you telling me that there are moments you doubt your salvation? Yes and amen. But I'm so thankful that my salvation does not hinge upon whether or not I wrestle with my doubt. See, my doubt oftentimes is inextricably connected to my feelings. But I can't trust my feelings. I have to stand on the promises of God's word. That Jesus keeps his word and he holds the guarantee of your salvation in heaven because of what he did. Matter of fact, John 14 verse 3, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. He doesn't leave it ambiguous. He goes, that where I am, you may be also. So these two major verses that I put in your notes are very strategic to our conversation today. And this is eternal life, knowing God and his son in whom he sent. So how do I know eternal life? It's connected to Jesus. First John 5, 13 says this, I write these things that you may know that you have eternal life. How do you know you have eternal life? John 10, 27 and 28 would say this, Jesus says, I give you eternal life and nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hands. As to say, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, interlocked you are by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And even in moments when we pull from him, he hangs on to you. And we'll speak about this in a few weeks. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of Christ. One of the things, yeah, come on, let's clap to that today. Just interrupt me. I need you to interrupt me. Don't let me just keep talking. Just interrupt me. Start clapping, shouting. But one of the things that happened not too long ago, I was reserving a vehicle at the Memphis International Airport. I was on my way to a speaking engagement. I got to the airport, and the rental car company was closed. You say, Ed, it must have been midnight. No, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So in this dilemma, I find myself holding a printed document declaring and decreeing that I have a reservation. But I have nobody to talk to. I go to the main counter. There's a sign that says go to another counter. I go to the other counter. There's nobody at that counter. Then I look at that other counter. There's three total counters. The one counter that would be by the gate that allows vehicles to get out of the rental car parking lot. Nobody at that counter, the other counter, and the primary counter. So all of a sudden, I'm holding a reservation. It was like a scene from Seinfeld. That is season three, episode 11, if anybody's paying attention. <laughs> Come on. Where Jerry... Seinfeld's having a conversation of asking the person behind the counter, what's the point of a reservation if nobody's holding the reservation? In the conversation of season three, episode 11, Jerry Seinfeld would say, you've missed the whole point of holding a reservation. The lady behind the counter says, I don't need you to tell me how to take reservations. He goes, that's the problem. There's a distinct difference between taking a reservation and holding a reservation because that's the whole point of making a reservation, that we make a reservation and you hold it. You fulfill it. 
the statement of there's a difference between taking reservations and holding reservations. Can I tell you, heaven's not taking reservations. Hold, heaven's holding reservations. You say, who's holding the reservation? So glad you asked that question. His name is Jesus. He's holding the reservation. And so when we understand our final destiny, come on, church, when we know where we're going, and when our life comes to an end, where we're going to be, it changes the details of today. Ask to say if my Jesus can hold me a place in heaven, not because my good deeds, my good efforts, my good merits, but because the finished work of the cross of Calvary and the empty tomb, then he can actually work in the details of my life that don't seem as if they're for my good. Come on, can we hear that today? If he's got heaven, he can help the here and now. The point number two, not only do we see an undeniable undeniable confirmation. But point number two, we see an unshakable clarification that in all things, in all things. You see, Ed, what are the things that the Apostle Paul is speaking about in every respect, regard, or manner of circumstance? You go, Ed, is that the good things? Absolutely. But our default is to think about the bad things. Now, I want to just use this illustration for a second. I'm going to ask Pastor Nick, our middle school pastor, to come join me on the stage. Pastor Nick, thank you so much for being willing to volunteer this morning. Not that you knew that, but I just asked you right before I got up to preach. I'm going to ask that you would hold this really cool hula hoop. Just put that over you and just hold it and face the congregation today. As we think about our life, by the way, this is the best hula hoop I could get, all right? So I just need you to know that. I was hoping to get a bedazzled hula hoop at some level, a cool hula hoop, but that's all we got, all right? So, so just bear with me for illustration's sake. The hula hoop is represent, representing not only the adversities, the absurdities, the abnormalities, the atrocities, the lack of accessibilities, and even the anxieties. You go, Ed, all of those things you're talking about represents the hula hoop. You go, what about the adversities? The things that feel as if it's just one challenge after the next. You say, so Ed, you're telling me that if we know that Jesus is holding our seat in heaven, then I should have a confidence in the adversities, in the absurdities, in the abnormalities, in the atrocities, in the lack of accessibilities, and even in my anxiety, there's a God who's in all things. You go, Ed, thank you so much for that. That's great clarification. But I need you to understand what the phrase means in all things. Things Because I, holding another hula hoop, just symbolically, once more, by no means am I saying I'm God. I'm just using this for illustration's sake. Oftentimes, we think God in his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his all-knowing power to change things. His goodness, oftentimes, we think, okay, all things work together for good. So we just think that God, somehow in the midst of this, he just wraps you up in his goodness, but does not get involved in the all things. That's not my Jesus. So let me just see if I can illustrate it this way, that my Jesus, when the Bible says in all things, doesn't mean that somehow he just gets you in proximity. Oh, no. He humbles himself, and he gets in all things and begins to envelop you with his goodness. Does that make sense? Did I, did I, did I, hit, did I hit you on top of the head? It's okay. But think about it this way. It's not the moment of going, hey, get your stuff figured out. Or God looks at you and goes, hate it for you. But instead, God in his goodness, his grace, all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipresent goes, I didn't leave you just unto yourself. And let me give this clarification. He's not the cause of the adversity. He's not the cause of the absurdities. He's not the cause of the abnormalities. He's not the cause of the atrocities. He's not the cause of your lack of accessibility. He's not the cause of your anxiety. But instead of you going, okay, God, where are you and what are you doing? Could we just flip the script and recognize that God in his goodness humbles himself and gets all up in your hula hoop with your struggles and your situation and even your battles? Come on, can we clap to that? Thank you, Pastor Nick. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, my man. So I got a little excited with the outline this week, to be honest with you. I was like, undeniable unshakable and then point number three there's an unstoppable unstoppable collaboration you go ahead what does that word work mean 
That's what I love about you, 9 o'clock service. You ask questions. I love to answer. The word work means to unite together by creating synergy. When the Bible says that in all things, God works. Come on, look at your neighbor right now and say, God's working. Look on the other side to your neighbor and say, God's working. That word, work, is where we get the word synergy. Synergy. Let me give some clarification on synergy. Synergy by definition. Synergy means this. Working together of various elements to provide a unique outcome. As to say, the components are the elements, and we can use synergy in a business level, personal level, relational level, financial level. We can use the word synergy. Matter of fact, there's synergy in this moment we're having. There's, there's, we're collaborating together. I'm speaking. You're amening. We're participating. We're engaging. There's synergy. That's why at CBC, you're the right fit for Pastor Ed. I'm just telling you. You are the right fit for me, and I feel like my whole life led me to this place. Synergy, thank you, I appreciate that. Synergy, working together. But synergy is the complementarianism of two components working together, creating a better outcome. So in my marriage relationship, there's synergy. My wife is the brains in the operation. She's 99% of the relationship. I'm the 1%. But there, thank you. I, Fellas, by the way, that was a great chance for you to amen and go, to look at your lady and go, yeah, I feel the same way. Great moment. Great moment. Yes, I'm still waiting for somebody to look at their lady and go, preach, preacher. Yes, preach, preacher. Synergy. When we talk about synergy, for example, in baking and cooking, Celebrated a birthday this past week, and my favorite cake is carrot cake. By, by the way, anybody that would just have the audacity, the courage, the bravery to say that your favorite cake is carrot cake. Anybody in the room besides me? We ought to start a Facebook group together, all 17 of us, right? But here's the crazy part about just that confession, I hate carrots, like, I'm not, I eat carrots because they're good for you. Like, they're good for your eyes, is what I was told. <laughs> Thus, I still wear glasses. And... But when you look at the individual ingredients of carrot cake, like, I've watched this be made. I, I don't enjoy eating flour all by itself. Definitely don't enjoy eating carrots all by itself, even though I do sometimes. And the only time I do that is when I'm eating at Wingstop and I get the, that Korean flavor barbecue wing and it lights my mouth on fire. And then I take that carrot and dip it in some ranch. God bless some ranch. Y'all with me? See, if carrots were really good, you wouldn't need ranch to dip them in. But when you individualize all the ingredients of carrot cake, you can look at all of those things like a stick of butter. Unless you're Paula Dean, you know, like, but it's butter. And Paula Dean's like favorite ingredient, butter. But nobody looks at a stick of butter and goes, scrumptious. Now, every once in a while, you may, you may get a teaspoon of it, but nobody's snacking on a brick of butter. Ground up cinnamon, you, you ever tried to swallow that? It'll choke you out. So all those individual ingredients, now watch this. When the Bible uses the word work, it's taking all of the things up in your hula hoop that you go, how is God going to do something with that? And he puts it in the mixer and starts working, moving. He's interjecting, interceding, introducing He's interweaving, integrating. He's just entering into the hula hoop, and he's just starting to mix these things together. And sometimes through the fiery, fiery process of trial and tribulation, what comes out on the other side is way better than how it first started. But sometimes we don't see it that way. It's really easy. 
really easy to look at our individual circumstances and go, God, where are you? And by no means am I looking at somebody in this room today going, Romans 8, 28, over your situation. Because your situation is real. Your situation is difficult. Your situation is overwhelming. Your situation, and I'm just seeking to empathize with somebody in the room going, okay, this divorce, this job loss, this miscarriage, losing my son or my daughter, whatever your situation may be, it's really easy for somebody to walk alongside of you and especially a preacher and go, Romans 8, 28, and not empathize in the process. Can I just say this as a footnote? Be really careful to Romans 8, 28 somebody when they're going through the, through the valley of the shadow of death. Don't Romans 8, 28 somebody when they just lose their kid. Don't like all of a sudden in the midst of them and just weeping and gnashing of teeth. Romans 8, 28, ain't nobody trying to hear that right now. The best thing you can do in that moment is just be there. Love them. And it may be a lifetime of discovering the Romans 8, 28 but when we understand Romans 8, 28, that there's a God that's working on our good, I want you to fill in these blanks here under point number three. God looks at you as his workmanship. You know Ephesians 2, 10. We know Ephesians 2, 8. By grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourself, verse 9 would say, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10 would say, we are his workmanship. Do you know the word workmanship? It's the reason why we sang this song today. And thank you, Pastor Phil, for introducing this new song, that he's the artist He's the potter, I'm the clay, I'm the canvas. The word workmanship means that you are his poem. He's mixing and weaving and moving all the things that somehow, some way, have a tendency to demise and destroy and damage. And God goes, I'm not the author of those things, but I sure enough will get all up in your hula hoop and begin to start changing and moving and interweaving and introducing and interjecting, doing something in and through this. And honestly, can we embrace this? There's nothing that could ever happen to you that God will not somehow, some way, work it out for your good. Somehow, some way. And some of you in this room, and I know many of your stories, you're still waiting on that day. And it may not happen on this side of heaven, but there'll be a moment where you'll see Jesus face to face, and I promise you the glimpse that you get of Jesus, it'll answer all your questions. It'll answer all your questions. But we are his workmanship. Could we be encouraged by this, that God overcomes? You go, Ed, why did you give us the word overcome? Because 1 John 2.14 wants to remind you of this, that God defeats Satan. I've read the end of the Bible. We win. So when we know that God beats Satan, understand your adversity, your absurdities, your abnormalities, all the things that we mentioned under point number two, the enemy, Satan himself, seeks to use those things to take you out. But you need to be reminded today that there's a God who fights your battles. That God overcomes. Not only does God overcome, but he also, God redeems. You go, Ed, what does the word redeem mean? It means to buy back. I'm so thankful we serve a God that takes the discarded things, the discredited things, the despised things, and begins to work and make all things new. Not only do we see workmanship, he overcomes he also redeems, but God knows. We already mentioned this verse earlier, Jeremiah 29, 11. He knows the plans he has for you. Honestly, this is what I love about what Pastor Jeff brought to us last week. Those plans are so beyond our thoughts and imagination. If God were to tell you the plans that he has for you, sometimes we wouldn't believe them because they're that good. And when we understand that God works, he supplies. Is that last fill in the blank underneath point number three? Workmanship overcomes, redeems, knows, supplies. What does that spell? Works. He works. There's synergy going on in your story. You just didn't even know it. Not only do we see this undeniable confirmation, this unshakable, unshakable clarification, this unstoppable, unstoppable collaboration. But point number four, we see an unmistakable consideration. Unmistakable consideration for the good. You go, Ed, what I'm facing right now, it ain't good. It's not good. But somehow we have to see that there's a God 
who's working for our good. The word good, I'll put this in your notes, is originating from a place of kindness towards kindness. You go, Ed, what do you mean by that? That our God is a good God. He's a good God. So he originates from a place of kindness to deliver kindness. If his heart is kindness, then what he delivers is kindness. You go, but my circumstance and my situation and struggle doesn't seem as if it's kind. We live in a broken world. God's not the cause of the confusion. God's not the cause of the crisis. God's not the cause of the chaos. He's the solution in the midst of it, which is why we need him all up in our hula hoop. And this God willingly, graciously wants to get in the mix so he can start synergizing, moving, mending, weaving your story for your greater good. And how does he do that? He does it with honor towards you. He does that with healing power in you, all with the purpose of desiring for him to be helpful through you. Here's the reason why. Because for many of us, the very struggles and the situation that we face, by no means that we pick it, but when we come through the other side of it, or even while we're dealing with it, God uses it to help somebody else. Now, let me just be honest with you today. For many of us in this room, we've identified what this was. For Pastor Nick, this was the illustration of all of the things that sometimes that feel as if they are not good. But when we understand that this, whatever this may be, God in the mix of it is working and synergizing, it helps us understand, much like Pastor Jeff said, that for many of us, we look at life through a series of opened and closed doors. So when we see the adversities and the atrocities and the absurdities and all the other points underneath point number two, it represents these different door knobs, these different doors, and they're locked like they, they don't move. And it just feels as if sometimes when we're looking at our circumstance, it just feels as if every door has been closed. But what Romans 8 teaches us today in verse 28, that there's a God who holds the key. And that one key of Romans 8, 28, you go, Ed, there's no way that one key unlocks all of these different doorknobs. This one key unlocks every single situation struggle, circumstance, battle, frustration, diagnosis, disease, whatever your circumstance may be. And sometimes it's a struggle. But when you begin to understand how Romans 8, 28 works, you begin to see that God has a bigger picture. And the bigger picture... is that he is the potter and we are the clay. But the joy of being a follower of this great God, he's still working, he's still moving, he's still shaping, he's still sculpting. And as we are in the Father's hands, Romans 8, 28, just the first part of it, reminds us, and this is the takeaway, that God is the artist. And he is the potter. And you and I are the canvas. And you and I are the clay. He takes all things. And he shapes them. And he sculpts them for your good. Why? Because he's good. Come on, let's stand together if you don't mind. And as we stand today, understanding the significance of what we've just learned today. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to ask a couple of questions, asking that you participate in these questions by a raised hand. How many of you identify clearly what your hula hoop was, your situation? How many of you went, Ed, I know exactly what my hula hoop is. I know exactly what it is. You can put your hands down. How many of you would just be honest today and just go, God, I don't see what you're doing I don't know how you're working. I hear this, but I'm wrestling 
with how you're going to make all things good. How many of you would just be honest about that today? Just raise your hand right where you're at. You're not alone. A raised hand is a statement of honesty and God welcomes our honesty. And what I love about this moment, when we raise our hands, just saying, this is the true confession of my heart. There's a God that says this to you today. I don't look down on you because of your doubt. I don't look down on you because your disbelief, but there's a God who's a good, good God that says, I'll prove it to you. I'll show you. But could our eyes be open and our ears be open to what God is going to do in revealing his goodness to you? In the first place we need to look today is to the cross of Calvary. Nothing good would have come from the cross if we didn't know the end of the story. All things work together for good. What the enemy sought to destroy Jesus with, the cross of Calvary, became not just a tool of persecution or tribulation, now but becomes the symbol of freedom and victory. What the enemy used to destroy Jesus, Jesus says, Romans 8, 28, look to the cross, I make all things new. And if you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus today, would you be so bold today to pray this prayer? This is more than a magical formula. It's you calling on the name of Jesus. If you've never done that before today, we invite you. If you're watching online or here in this room, just be willing to say this to Jesus and mean it, mean it from the depths of your heart. Just say this to him, Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me, change me, I give you my life. Today, if you prayed that prayer in faith, calling on the name of Jesus and you're watching from home, please text in the number that's on the screen. Somebody's gonna to respond to you. But if today you prayed that prayer in faith for the very first time, we're a church that loves to celebrate and champion those who've made that decision. And if you made that decision today, do not be ashamed. Just hold up your hand as tall as you can so we can lose our ever-loving mind. Cheering for you today. If you gave your life to Jesus today, just hold up your hand as tall as you can. Anybody in the room today? Anybody in the room today? Just hold up your hand as tall as you can. And as you do that today, we're cheering, we're clapping.